Today we're going to be learning about this stamp and the man who is on it. And he'll take us on quite an adventure to Antarctica and North Pole and South Pole, which is Antarctica. So, yeah. <laughs> this stamp was issued in 1888 along with a set of three other stamps, I believe, to commemorate Antarctic explorers. As you can see here, the shape of Antarctica is right up there, and that is what Antarctica looks like. Then we have Admiral, Admiral Richard Byrd. Um, so yeah, this is what the stamp is. We don't know exactly what the plane is, but I believe it's one of the planes he used to get to the, that he used for his expedition. Before I get started with the story of Richard E. Bird, um, I want to give a colossally huge ginormous thanks to Graham Beck, owner of the Exploring Stamps YouTube channel. And the reason I'm thanking him is because he posted me on his Twitter account and got me some more subscribers. Um, so follow him on his social media platforms in the descriptions below, um, if you haven't already. And I do call, I call him the father of philately on YouTube because everybody sort of knows him. And he's like... He's the reason I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> this stamp was issued in 1888, along with a set of three other stamps, I believe, to commemorate Antarctic explorers. As you can see here, the shape of Antarctica is right up there, and that is what Antarctica looks like. Then we have Admiral, Admiral Richard Byrd. Um, so yeah, this is what the stamp is. We don't know exactly what the plane is, but I believe it's one of the planes he used to get to the, that he used for his expedition. Let's learn about Richard now. Bird was born on October 25th, 1888 in Winchester, Virginia. He was the son of Richard Evelyn Bird and El Eleanor Bowling Flood. His father was a judge, politician, and lawyer. In 1908, Byrd attended the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Byrd was assigned to many United States ships, including the USS Kentucky, USS Wyoming, and USS Dolphin. While serving aboard the USS Washington in Mexican waters, well, while serving in Mexican waters, he saved a man who had fallen overboard, and he was rewarded with the Congressional Life Saving Medal. In 1915, Bird married Mary Ames of Boston, and they had four children, including one named Richard Bird III. Well, I don't know if he was named the third, but he was the third Richard Evelyn Bird. <laughs> in 1919, Bird planned the flight route of the historic transatlantic crossing. Only one of the three flying boats um, completed it. In 1921, Bird was assigned to the ZR2 formerly known by the British as the R-38, and is a terribly dangerous airship. That, uh, that is why it's infamous. <laughs> um, fortunately for Bird, he missed his train to the flight, and in midair, it exploded, killing 44 of the 49 crew members aboard. Many of those lost were his friends, and that made safety a number one on his future missions. In 1926, Bird was said to have made the first flight to the North Pole with his friend Floyd Bennett. They won a medal for, of honor for this, but there was some controversy to whether he actually did make it to the North Pole. And I forgot to say this, but he made it to the North Pole via airplane. Bernd Balchin, a Norwegian pilot, states that they could have made the flight to the North Pole in such a short amount of time. Another Floyd... Bennett also confessed to Bernd Balchin that they didn't actually reach the North Pole, although every time Floyd Bennett was interviewed or wrote an article or something, he always said that they reached the North Pole. In around the 1960s, after Bird was dead, they found his diary, and they found an erased part in it that said about 80% of the way there, they had to turn, they want, they decided to turn around because there is a oil leak in the plane. So, if if this is all true, the first people to 
reached the North Pole are Roland Madsen, Lincoln Ellsworth, Oscar Wisting, and Umberto Nobile. On April 20th, 1927, Bert was going to try and do the transatlantic flight, this time nonstop. Unfortunately, Floyd Bennett and Bird, because Bird named Floyd Bennett as his pilot again, um, their plane America crashed and it severely injured Floyd Bennett. I think he died later because of it, unfortunately. Um, so while they were getting their plane repaired, airplane, Charles Lindenberg completed the crossing. This stamp commemorates Charles Lindenberg's crossing and here's the first day cover. Here's where us philatelists get really interest, well, interested. It's not like super interesting, this one part, but Richard Bird and Bernd Balchin, the Norwegian pilot, did complete it the next day, the transatlantic crossing nonstop. And they did, when they reached France, it was really cloudy, so they landed in Normandy, crash landed, but they're all all right. But anyways, to show the practi pr how practical the aircraft was, they had a bunch of U.S. mail inside of it. So that's something I found interesting that I thought I would share with all of you. Now we're in the year of 1928, Bird's first Antarctic expedition. And to increase interest in the youth of exploring, they brought a 19-year-old Boy Scout named Paul Almond Seipel. And he was the probably the only man other than Bird himself to go to all five of the expeditions of Bird's. Um, so when the expedition crew arrived, they set up a base called Little America on the Ross Ice Shelf. If you're wondering what an ice shelf is, just like I am um, a tiny bit right now, not a tiny bit, but a little bit, I found out, because the descriptions were all a little hard to understand, I found out that it was essentially a glacier, a part of a glacier that has floated down a coastline and attached itself to a piece of land. If you do know anything else about the Ross, or I mean about an ice shelf, please let me know because I'm not an expert on ice shelves. Ross Ice Shelf is huge. It is, a, on the surface, it is around the size of France. On the vertical front of the ice shelf, the Ross Ice Shelf, it is around one. It is around 50 to 160 feet high, and that is only 10% of it. The other 90% is underwater. And huge chunks break off of it regularly. Regularly. I don't know how to say that word. That's like one of the words, English words. I don't know how to say well. But huge chunks break off of it. One time when the little Bird's Little America base was on the rice, Ross Ice Shelf, um, a chunk broke off so big it brought a Little America with it. <laughs> So, yeah. Now, getting back to the story. The expedition, the scientific expedition, began via snowmobile, airplane, snowshoe, and dog sled. During the su summer, they did geological surveys and documented everything with photographs. When the winter came, they paused, and I'm guessing because of temperature. During November in the year of 1929, Bird and Balchin made the first flight across, um, to the North Pole. Wait a minute. How do we know they're not? Bird was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral at the age of 41, making him the youngest admiral in, U in the history of the U.S. Navy. On June 18, 1930, the expedition crew returned home. In 1933, um, Bird's second expedition started. When, in 1934, Bird's five months in isolation began. There, he operated a meteorological station named Advance Base. When unusual transmissions from Bird, and Bird came in, men went to search for him. The first two times were, ju were futile attempts, and on the third time, they found him. The men found him suffering with carbon di monoxide poisoning because of a poorly ventilated stove. This book named Alone, is an autobiography about Bird's months in isolation. Bird fortunately survived, and in 1939, Bird had his third expedition. This time, the U.S. government funded it. 
They did studies of meteorology, biology, geology, and exploration. Thanks, everybody, for supporting me and watching. Um, also, on my last video and on this video, I enabled the comments. So, if you want to say anything or correct me or anything, you can now. And, yeah. Also, um, I do write the scripts myself. I do not copy them off articles. I mean, I read the articles and then translate them into my own words using the dates and everything. And also, um, I want the U.S. Postal Service to make... Well, if you're... First, let me say this. If you're a Star Wars fan just like I am, I want the U.S. Postal Service to make Bad Batch stamps because that is one of my favorite Star Wars series and it's... There's new season um, episodes coming out like once a week or something. So I just... Um, help me, if you like Star Wars 2, just write to the U.S. Postal Service and ask them to make the stamps and I'll give you the address to write to in the description below. So yeah, and thanks for watching. Thank you, Grambeck. <laughs> bye bye.